Sarah Verma is an assistant professor at RP Center of Ophthalmic Sciences, Olney Institute of Medical Sciences. And he's an ACE clinician and a vitreo retinal surgeon. And uh, over the last six months, we have had three cases of supracolloidal hemorrhage after trabeculectomy. And uh, all three cases were managed. And one of the cases, despite management, went into thysis bulbi. So I thought this is a very important complication which should be highlighted to all the glaucoma fraternity. <clears throat> so he, Saurav will be discussing how to manage and how to prevent the occurrence of supracortical hemorrhage after glaucoma surgery. So over to you, Dr. Saurav. Uh, thank you very much sir, for the kind introduction. Um, I'll be discussing about management of supracortical hemorrhage post glaucoma surgery. Um, is my screen visible to you? Yes, yeah, screen is vis nicely visible. Okay, so it is collection of blood in supracoroidal space due to rupture of long or short posterior ciliary arteries and filtration surgery is one of the most common ocular surgery to be associated with supracoroidal hemorrhage. It, the incidence is very low, varying from around 0.7 to 2%, but it is still significant. It occurs due to high preoperative IOP, which drops suddenly intraoperatively. So there was a major study by Waziri et al., which evaluated the incidence of post-operated uh, supracoroidal hemorrhage after glaucoma filtration surgeries in about 17,800 trabeculectomies and 9,500 tube surgeries. And they found out that the risk of supracoroidal hemorrhage was almost twice as high in the tube group. A similar study by Tuli et al. showed that the incidence of supracoroidal hemorrhage is increased with the use of anti-metabolites and non-valved tube shunt implants. Other important risk factors include white rays, use of anticoagulant drugs in the preoperative period, severe post-operative hypotony, presence of pafakia, ACIL, or myopia. In the preoperative period, we have to bring down intraocular pressure and blood pressure to the normal limit. If possible, and the patient is on anticoagulants, then we should try and stop the anticoagulant drugs. During the surgery, we have to manage the blood pressure and the cardiac rate. And also the patient has to be instructed to avoid severe bouts of cuff if possible. In the post-operative period, again, patient is to be instructed to avoid all forms of trauma un and avoidable straining. And inflammation and hypotony, if present, is to be managed accordingly. Signs of intraoperative supracoroidal hemorrhage include increased IOP, sudden change in red reflex and vitreous prolapse. And if suspected, prompt closure of the surgical site is warranted. Presence of pre-placed scleral flap sutures might really help in this scenario. If the globe contents are expelling, we can try and reposit them, but we might actually have to compromise this tissue, cut this tissue away so as to achieve rapid resuturing of the ostium. And in some cases, you can also try to drain supracoroidal hemorrhage right on the spot to reposit tissue, but it is generally not recommended. In the post-operative period, patients present with intense pain, decreased vision, slit lamp examination, and indirect ophthalmoscopic examination helps in confirming the diagnosis. So ultrasonography has a very important role to play in the diagnosis and management. It is helpful in localization and marketing the, marking the extent of expulsive hemorrhage. It can also help in assessing the state of clot lysis. So in the first image, you can see there is blood in the supracoroidal space, but it has high internal reflectivity, which is suggestive of clotted nature of the blood, which would be difficult to remove. But in the second image, there is low internal reflectivity in the supracoroidal space, which is suggestive of uh, lice blood, which would be relatively easy to remove. Generally, it takes about 10 to 14 days for the blood to lyse. So this is the ideal time at which supracoroidal drainage, if needed, should be attempted. Early drainage may be required in cases with high IOP, intolerable pain, flat anterior chamber, a coexisting retinal detachment, deteriorating vision, or in the presence of kissing choroidals. So while you are following up these patients in the first week or so after the occurrence of supracoroidal hemorrhage, you have to assess two things, liquefaction and the height of CD. If the height of CD is reducing on its own, then you don't need to intervene. But if the height is increasing or the patient has progressed to a state of kissing choroidal, as seen in the first image on the ultrasound, then we have to uh, intervene surgically. If there is no coexisting vitreoretinal pathology, then uh, an, uh, external drainage through sclerotomy would be sufficient. So the conventional technique of drainage is via sclerotomy. Um, this was a patient who had developed supracoroidal hemorrhage 
the maximum height of the mound was noted to be in the inferior nasal quadrant. We have already done a localized peritomy and hooked and bridled the muscles to bring about proper exposure of the area. Now we are making an AC entry through which an AC maintainer would be inserted to provide positive pressure. After uh, achieving diathermy of the required side, a sclerotomy is made. This sclerotomy is made around 7 to 8 mm behind the limbus. This is the height part where the height of the choroidal mound is maximum and we can have a safe access into the supracoroidal space. As soon as we enter into the supracoroidal space, blood starts to come out. And then, But a problem with this technique is that the, the two lips of the sclerotomy tend to fall over each other as the IOP decreases and then we have to use additional instruments like a forcep or an iris repositor to keep these lips apart so that we can achieve sufficient drainage. So now we have largely shifted to a modified technique using uh, 20 gauge, 23 gauge or 25 gauge cannula. So this is the same patient in which an external drainage was attempted but in the post-operative period, we found that the drainage was not sufficient. So we repeated the procedure, but now with a modified technique, again, an AC maintainer was put. And this time we are in inserting a trocar, a 25 gauge trocar into the supracoroidal space. Important thing to note here is that the cannula is being inserted at an acute angle to the sclera, unlike perpendicular entry, which is advocated in VR surgeries. And also the entire length of the cannula is not inserted. Only the tip of the inserted uh, of the cannula is inserted. Uh, these two maneuvers ensure that you actually open the cannula in the supracoroidal space instead of hitting the choroidal tissue and causing further damage. And you see, as we take out the troca, the supracoroidal blood comes out on its own we can then apply some gentle manipulations over the eyeball so as to coerce the blood to come out of this cannula. A major advantage of using this cannula is that unlike the scleral flaps of the sclerotomy, there is a rigid tube in the supracoroidal space, which is not going to collapse on its own. And hence, a better drainage can be achieved. This is another patient. But here, instead of making the entry at 4 mm, we are making entry at about 7 mm from the limbus. And again, here you can see, as we will retract the trocar out of the cannula, the blood comes out on its own. We are able to achieve very uh, efficient supracoroidal drainage without much manipulation. Again, we are retracting the cannula slightly out. This opens up a new pocket and further drainage of blood is achieved. So the next question is, what is the ideal site of insertion of the trocar cannula system? As you can see in this illustration, when we are inserting the trocar at a 4 mm distance from limbus, the tip of the trocar would lie slightly closer to the choroidal tissue and hence is more likely to hit the choroidal tissue. Whereas when we are inserting it at 8 mm, this is the site where the height of the choroidal mound is maximum. So we will have greater safety. So largely we recommend that this insertion should be tried at 4 mm, uh, at 8 mm away from the limbus, though 4 mm insertion is also uh, very efficient. Uh, visual outcomes are very poor. This is pri uh, primarily because of leakage from ostium leading to worsening of supracoroidal hemorrhage, snuff out of the central visual field due to eye fluctuations, and often these surgeries have to be combined with closure of the ostium leading to uncontrolled IOP. If there is a coexisting retinal detachment or the supracoroidal hemorrhage was involving all 360 degree quadrants, then the visual outcome is especially poor and not more than 20% of the eyes are able to achieve visual acuity greater than 20 by 200. In the end, I would like to summarize by saying that we have to take all the necessary precautions for optimizing all the parameters so as to prevent supracoroidal hemorrhage from happening. If it is recognized intraoperatively, we have to immediately close the wound, follow up the patient with serial ultrasonography to monitor liquefaction and height of CD, Ideal time of drainage would be around 7 to 14 days. An external drainage with trocar cannula system is very easy and safe to perform. Thank you. Thank you.